Hey Robot Makers, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. So do you want to learn how to build your own home server or home lab using a Raspberry Pi 5? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots and other things. <laughs> <laughs> lost my thread now, uh, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Right, let's get over to our our slides. We've only got a few slides and then we're going to get right into the demo today, like we did last week, because that seemed to work really well. So yeah, this is about building the ultimate home lab and home server. So we're going to be building this home server. I've got a brand new Raspberry Pi 5 over here. I'll just mute that for a second. Um, and we're going to basically open this up. We're going to load this up with uh, Raspberry Pi OS and then we're going to install Docker on it really quick using a script I've created. The ultimate Docker install script, you might say. We're going to, uh, why are we going to use a Raspberry Pi 5, you might ask? You might have uh, quite plenty of other computers lying around that you could do this on as well. Well, for me, it's about the speed and the memory of the Pi 5 and also the fact you can now have the NVMe um, for disk space as well as you can have plenty of room to install all your different apps and try stuff out in your home lab uh, and also serve things to your family with your home server so how we're going to do this we're going to do this with docker and some really cool home apps i'm going to show you today so let's go let's get into this shall we so what's the difference, first of all, between a home lab and a home server? And then I promise we'll get into a, a bit of a live demo. So home server runs apps designed for use in the home. So that they might stream music, videos. It might um, host audio books, things like that. Uh, your family photo album, file storage like a NAS. It can do home automation through things like home assistant. Uh, family calendaring, recipes and meals, we'll have a look at one that we've created on there. Whereas a home lab is more for learning and exploring technology. So you're going to be building and testing different things out. You can bring these up on Docker, tear them down, and it's, it basically doesn't leave a trace behind. It's very experimental in nature. And the, the cost in the space is maybe a bit more elaborate than a home server because you might use more than one computer. So one of the things I'm looking to do very soon, just behind me, there is a four Raspberry Pis just flickering away there that are in a little rack. And I'm going to replace those Raspberry Pi 4s with some Raspberry Pi 5s. So this is what basically made me think about the, the home lab and the home server element to it because we run our home server on our home lab. So that's kind of where we're coming from. So let's get straight into it, shall we then? Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get over to um, a browser and I'm gonna show you, uh, let's just open up a nice new empty browser. Let me get over here. And I'm basically just gonna go to home.kevsmac.com. So this is a website, I'm gonna show you how I've done all this today. So this is a website that's running some software that's called Homer. We're gonna have a look at Homer. You can just see the, uh, the name of it there, H-O-M-A-R-R. Uh, and this is a free piece of software that you can install on a computer and create dashboards, really easy to use dashboards. And it can do a lot more than I'm probably going to show you today, but I just wanted to sort of give you a flavor of the kind of thing that it can do. So I've loaded up some apps that my home server is streaming out or making available to anyone on my local area network. And because I've got some routing as well, I'm going to show you how to do that later on, we can actually expose these to the internet securely um, and mean that we can access these anywhere on the go and even on our mobile phones. So the first one we're going to have a look at today is something called that's, that's called Mealy. So I've got um, a quick link there, foo.kevsmac.com for this one. And I'm just going to sign myself in on here just with a password I've got saved. Okay, let's get myself logged in. And what we can do on here is we can have all kinds of different uh, uh, meals that we've set up on here. So let's have a look at some uh, classic pesto, for example. So this one, we can we can say that we've made this, we can see what the ingredients are, we can see what the steps are and things like that, and even have a little picture. And we can put all those together in like a family cookbook so that we can uh, share that out with them amongst our family. So I think this is like a really cool app. You can even build out things like meal planners, shopping lists. You can have a timeline of when you added various different things and who added the, the recipe and so on. So yeah, I really quite like this one. This is a nice, simple one to add to our, our home server. Now, I'm a bit of a, a geek, so I like to do techie things such as home automation, uh, home assistant, that kind of thing. So one of the things I did in the early days, and it's still running on my Raspberry Pis, is Node-RED. So if I click on that button there, we can get straight over to my Node-RED instance, and you can see I've got all the kinds of flows set up on there to grab data from various different sensors. Some of them are Pimroni Enviro sensors. Some of them are things I've created myself. These things like a subscribe account, the bathroom fan, for example. We can even control a robot 
from this. Um, this is a burger bot. So basically it just listens to an MQTT broker and that means that it can listen to messages and then react to them. And we can even create like a dashboard, which is what these, these things down here do. So we've covered the um, Node-RED in a show in quite a lot of detail previously. So I'm not gonna show you how to set that up, but this is something that just sits on my Raspberry Pi instances and uh, means that we can do all that kind of clever stuff in the background. So that's Node-RED. Uh, now, quite a few of you might have already set up Home Assistant. Um, I've got this running in a Docker container as well. Uh, and that also means that I can tear this up, tear this down, very simple, bring it up, bring it down. I'm gonna show you how simple it is to do that in a moment. And uh, look at this, I've got this home automation. I've only got a few things set up on here, but um, it found my Elgato uh, lights in the studio. So if I hit this button here, you'll see I go all dark, and a little bubble in the corner there. So that's uh, home automation. It's uh, working over Zigbee, Wi-Fi, and so on. You can even see my HP printer there. You can see I need some uh, color ink being sent to me at some point. And again, there's plenty of videos out there about Home Assistant. I think I did do a show on that quite a while ago as well. So I'm not gonna show you how to set up Home Assistant. This is more about how you can install these apps really, really simply. And I'm gonna show you the trick for doing that in Docker shortly. And the weather station. So uh, in the UK at the moment, it's actually quite windy. There is a storm. Is it Isha or something? I can't remember what it's called, Alex. Yeah, something like that. It begins with I. And uh, yeah, so it's like, quite windy. So if I look at uh, this weather station that I've got upset. So this weather station is the Pimroni um, weather station that they sell. They sell it with um, a hat that goes onto a Raspberry Pi. And you also get all the, all the anemometers and equipment that goes outside, rain sensors, um, gas sensors, all that kind of good stuff. Well, the gas sensors are actually a different sensor. Let me show what they are. So um, I bought this kit from the Raspberry Pi store this weekend. This is an Enviro Plus from Pimeroni. This is like an air quality sensor. So that's a hat that sits on your Raspberry Pi. And they also do another module that goes with that, which can detect particulates in the air, this PMS 5003. So that sort of goes hand in hand with that. I do have an early version of that over there, but um, at the moment it's not bringing any data in, so I need to look at why that's not working. But anyway, the point here, here is that uh, we have all this weather sensor data, and unless you know the exact URL or something, it can be hard to remember where it is. So our home server, as well as hosting all this information, storing it all in an influx database so that we can graph it really nicely, and we're using Grafana to uh, show that data, we can easily get to that and have a shortcut for everybody else to, to click on from uh, either their mobile phone. And all they have to remember is just the home.kevsmac.com, for example. Now down here, we've got a little notepad area, so you can um, you can sort of click on this and start editing some text. You can leave like notes for the fridge, that kind of thing. I've got a shortcut there to kevsrobots.com. If I click on that, we'll get over to uh, kevsrobots.com. And I've also got a link to my TrueNAS server. So I have a BSD server that's uh, running TrueNAS just down to my left and that's got I think about five or six terabytes of storage it's where I shove all the uh, the videos once I've um, I've uh, finished recording them and I've got a couple of other things on here and I'm going to show you there's a there's an error there we need to fix that in a second I'm going to show you how easy that is to do so my 3d printers I've got two 3d printers I've just put a shortcut to one of them on there I've not actually got it running at the moment and you can notice there's a little red dot down there and that means that it's currently unreachable whereas these other things are reachable because they've got that little green dot so it just does a little HTTP check to see are these things up and running or not. I've also got a link to I think the uh, the Discord server there as well. So this little um, um, nodule here, what would you call it, a node or a, a tile, maybe the tile's best, um, this currently isn't pushing any data. This is looking for a component that's called Dash. So let me show you how you edit these dashboards real quick. Um, first of all, you can actually switch the theme. So if you want it to be like a dark theme, a lot of people prefer that. But I just thought for this live stream, it's actually a bit easier to see uh, if it's this uh, lighter theme. So if I click on this little um, pencil thing here, it says we're now in edit mode. And you can see we've got these little cogs in the corner. And we can click on this little button here to add a tile. So we can add an app, we can add a widget, or we can add categories. So I've got a category down there, which is for one for home, one for 3D printing. And if we go back up to there, we can add in a widget. And one of the widgets is something that's called dash. It's actually called dash dot, um, just to make it a bit easy. You can see the little full stop there. Uh, so dash dot. So we can add in a dash uh, node just by clicking on that button there. And you can see up here, 
we've now got a dash tile and if we click on this little cog we can then edit the details of that so it basically just wants to have a url uh, pointing to a dash server so i'm just going to type in a number let's just see if um i can't remember if i've actually got dash running on this one or not but we're actually going to set that up in a second so if i just do that i don't think it is running on that particular server yeah so that one isn't running similar to this one here so we're going to have a play with that in a second okay so let me show you how we can install that real quick so if i load up here this is actually one of my new raspberry pi um, raspberry pi servers raspberry pi computers at raspberry pi 5 and currently i've all that i've got installed on this one is a couple of docker containers which are running code and i've also got this clustered pi clustered pi is the name that i gave to that little cluster of raspberry pis behind me and there's also a website which is uh, clusteredpi.com it's uh, if i type it in clustered pi.com i can't remember if it's dash pi or, or just that i think it might be dash pi anyway if we want to actually grab the code uh, that's got all the stacks in it stacks are a um, a docker convention for if you want to have lots of different services or maybe just one service running then you can create a stack so i've got a whole bunch of stacks one of them is called dash so let's get dash up and running so if i do cd dash so you can get all these just by doing a git clone of this uh, repository i'll show you how to do that um, in a second once we set up a new raspberry pi so if i just do ls there's only a couple of files in here let me just do ls dash l just to see that so the docker compose let's cat let's have a look inside that docker compose file because that has all the magic in it so it's only got a couple of lines in here first of all we've got this version number 3.5 and then we've got a service so the service is called dash the image so this is kind of like a packaged up image of all the dependencies all the, the program code everything that's needed to run dash uh, is contained within that at that um, so this is actually in a repository so docker has a repository hub.docker.com and in the um, what's that mori senio slash dash dot it's going to pull the latest version of that and it's going to run it unless it's been stopped so it'll carry on running if you reboot this it'll start the service up as well which is really cool it's going to run as privilege which means it kind of runs as like a pseudo user and the reason for that is because dash is going to pull some cpu and memory usage things so it needs access to that sort of kernel level stuff and it's going to export this or expose this on ports 3001 so that's the external port that it's going to map the internal port to and the reason we do this mapping is because you might actually want to have something running um, on port 80 rather than port 3001 and port 80 is what we call http port 443 would be https for example um, and then we've got these volumes a volume is um, like a file system but it's contained within docker as a single file so it means it's really easy to copy an entire of stuff around thank you for subscribing john let me just uh, go over here and uh, just switch that over there there we go and all we need to do to bring this up so um let's just type that back in there so docker compose up and i'm going to do i'm going to just do docker compose up to begin with and this is basically going to bring that entire application up and start running it right away so you can see there it says it's listening on port 3001 and it's grabbing all this kind of information so if i now go back over um, to our um, our dashboard over here let's see if we can get this uh, to pull that information through so if i go over here let's see if we can get that to uh, pull the information through so i think this is actually running on 232 on port 3001 i'm going to save that out uh, did i have the right http yep that looks correct let me make sure that server is actually yep 1.2232 and it will be we really should be able to see that information coming through so that's 232 and 3001 let's just save that out uh, for some reason it's not happy with this uh, i know why that is and that's because i'm running on my i've actually connected through a https service and because of that it's saying that this this um is sending data to http rather than https which is the secure one so if i actually just switch over to uh, the local version of this so if i just go to i think we're on th uh, 
75, 75. There we go. And let's just see if we can get this to pull the information through. There we go. So we can now see that Dash is now pulling through that information, um, which is it's showing the CPU usage and also the RAM. We can actually go over to that machine in a, and actually look at the, uh, the Dash kind of proper. So this is what Dash looks like. It's just a nice little uh, utility that shows you what's going on there. We can see all the different cores. Raspberry Pis have four cores. So we can see that it's basically idling. It's not doing very much at all. Uh, you can see there the, the NVMe drive's got uh, basically a lot of stuff free on there. And we're basically not really using very much memory at all. And there's the network bandwidth as well. So I quite like Dash um, to be running on all my different servers because it basically doesn't take up very much memory. And you get this lovely little dashboard that you can just connect to. Uh, and you don't have to use 3001. You can map that to whatever you'd like. So that was really, really simple. Now that's currently running um, on here. If I just do um, stop and we go back to here, you can see it's basically unable to connect to the back end because we've stopped it. So we basically just do dash D for run detached, run in the background and only stop once uh, I tell it to stop. So if I now go back to that, you can see it's back up and running again, no problem. So that's how easy it is to run some of these things in your home server and your home lab just by using Docker and creating these compose files. So that's what I wanted to show you there. I'm gonna go back now to my slides so we can have a, a bit more of a look at some of these apps. So we looked at Home Assistant. Now there's one that's really cool that's called Jekyll Fin. If you do a lot of media streaming and you want to do that in-house without going out to Netflix or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus or Discovery or whatever million different things are out there, you can stream. If you've ripped your Blu-rays and your DVDs to a disc, you can use Jelly Fin to do all the discovery of what those, image, those videos are, that music is, and stream it out from uh, your Raspberry Pi home network. We've just looked at Dashdot, which is that nice little app for showing you monitoring servers. Nginx is something we'll be using um, to do some complex routing on our networks. I use this to host um, the kevsrobots.com and also clustered pi websites. And this also does some load balancing. So because I've got four servers, each one of them is running an instance of the, uh, the website kevsrobots.com. And when you hit the server, you're hitting one of those servers and the next person that comes in to look at the, the server hits the second one and then the third one. It kind of does it in a round robin technique and Nginx does that load balancing for me. We've just looked at Docker. We're going to look at how to install Docker very shortly. I'll do that as a bit of a live demo in a second. And we can use Portainer to manage Docker. Portainer is a really nice interface. It's a web interface. So rather than to remember all those command line things, you can just point and click and see all your, your images, all your volumes and everything within Docker um, just on a web page. So I used Portainer quite a bit. We looked at Mealy, which is that recipes um, program. This is really nice. And Homer is the dashboard that I use to store all those clickable buttons, those clickable tiles, and make it accessible for everybody who isn't as IT savvy as me on our home network. So if you think I'm missing some apps that should be on here, definitely put a comment in the, the video below and let me know what you want to see on here. I know there is a lot that relate to Jellyfin. There's like Sonar and... Um, other uh, um, plugins and they basically just do a lot of housekeeping for your uh, your ripped video content. So yes, that's sort of really, really cool. So Docker Home Server and Home Lab Essentials. These are the things I think we absolutely should have on here. So just gonna talk about Docker for a second, just for those people who don't know what this is. So Docker is a platform for developing, shipping and running applications. Uh, it enables you to separate out your applications and infrastructure so you can very quickly deliver and deploy software. It's very easy to develop it. So I've created a, a search engine for kevrobots.com using Docker, using some of these techniques we're looking at here. So with Docker, you can manage your infrastructure, you can manage your networks. And this is why it's a, a home lab environment. Uh, the same way that you manage your applications. And you can also do this all in code. So you can actually save all that configuration, tear it down, build it up, um, in a new area just by using that code and that configuration. And you can take advantage of Docker's methodologies for shipping, testing, deploying code very quickly, and you can reduce that delay between writing code and getting the application running. And I can attest to that. I wrote a search engine in less than an afternoon, um, basically just using Docker. So 
there are some differences between containers and virtual machines so I just wanted to cover this off so if you think on the left hand side there we have these containerized applications so application a b c d these could be uh, the melee or the home assistant each one of these can be in a separate container then we've got docker that coordinates kind of orchestrates all those applications we have the host os and then we have the infrastructure that that's running on whereas on a virtual machine you have an application which is running on a guest operating system and all that stack is being emulated in a hypervisor and then you might have a second virtual machine that also has an application and a full operating system and then there's a third one so there's a lot more bloat in there there's a lot more um, emulating of the guest os it's not really needed so you can do just as much in a lot less memory a lot faster using containers so this is one of the reasons we we look at this so containers are this abstraction layer that sits between package code and all the dependencies and you can have multiple containers running on the same machine they all share the same os kernel uh, and they are all separate from each other separate processes all running a user space and they take up less space than virtual machines they're typically tens of megabytes rather than uh, gigabytes and they can handle a lot more applications require a few vms compared to yeah compared to a vm a vm vms are a physical abstraction of hardware sorry they're a logical abstraction of physical hardware turning one server into many servers they have a hypervisor that allows multiple vms to run on a single machine and each vm includes a full copy of the operating system the application the binaries the libraries taking up tens of gigabytes so vms can be quite slow to boot up so this is where docker really comes into its own that's why i've chosen this so a container is a sandbox process on your machine that means it's separate uh, and isolated from all the other processes on your host machine and that means that they're also they're also secure and that isolation leverages things like such as kernel namespaces cg groups these features have been on linux for a very long time and they're the thing in the background that makes that isolation se uh, and separation possible so docker's worked on many of these capabilities and made it appro more approachable and easier to use than things like a vm so how does it do this in the background so we have a client this can either be portainer this could be a remote api or a dashboard or just the docker command line then we have the host itself so in this case ours is a raspberry pi 5 we have several containers that are in there which run all the application code an image is a, a, a container that isn't running so an image is kind of um, what the container will run so images you might have one image for say ubuntu and then you can have several containers all running that image so, but they're all running their own instance of it and a registry is a kind of collection of all the different images that are possible that you could have you can have a local registry or you can use the docker hub or third party registry um, to store all those images ready for you to download and that just means you don't have to have all the images installed on your machine you can basically just pick and choose which you uh, require so hub.docker.com is where they um, mostly reside so things that they need to run the kind of resources um, docker needs for a container to run is a volume so this is a logical storage for each container like its own file system you can have a network you can have different types of networks several networks you can have isolated networks uh, shared networks uh, specific ip addresses which is quite cool uh, and basically this is the ip address to connect to the outside world and then we have ports so ports is that number that we have like port 80 for http and that allows traffic to flow between different machines so ports are a bit like a, a, a something you can plug into i guess so to install docker this is the script uh, i put together to install it so you can just go to getdocker.com uh, and there is a script that they have ready for you to, uh, to download there but i found that requ that requires you to do like sudo docker you have to run it as a super user so you can get around that by basically running this script so we do a sudo apt get update that will update the operating system we do a sudo apt install so lib fifi uh, <laughs> fi dev uh, lib ssl dev python 3 and python pip that's just some dependencies that we need and then curl will download the uh, get docker script and it will output that to homepy get docker.sh the only thing to watch there is that homepy whatever you call the username when you create your raspberry pi um, setup i used to call it kev so that might change there then we have this change mode plus x and that basically makes the script executable and then we can run that get docker script and that will install docker 
once it's been installed, we then want to add the Pi or the, the Kev user in my case uh, to a group that's called Docker and we want to give that uh, permission to run. And then we can do this system control unmask Docker and then we can change the, the uh, file permission on the run docker.soc and that's kind of the SOC is a socket and it's an, a way of other applications can communicate with Docker to get things like stats and so on. And then we do pip3-v install docker compose. I'm not sure why it's got the dash v, that just gives you the version, but this will install docker compose. So we can do that bring up and bring down. And then finally, we just do system control start docker and that'll just start the docker running. So we're gonna do this uh, in a second live. And then we can do various different things with Docker. So we can we can list what volumes we have. We can create a volume and it basically just creates like an empty file ready for a full file system to exist in there for that particular Docker container. We can remove a volume just by doing Docker volume RM, which is like remove and then the name of the uh, volume. And you, you only have to type the first couple of letters of it for it to recognize it. It's got quite a nice kind of auto complete there. You can also bind, rather than having a volume, you can bind a file system uh, to a mount point as well if you wish to do that. So uh, you can basically do this by doing docker run and then dash dash mount and then what the, the source is and what the target is within um, the docker instance. So that's one way of doing it as well. I use that sometimes if I want to expose files from outside of the docker um, to the file system within it. And then you can basically just run Docker. You can do Docker pull. That will pull the image down to your local machine. Getting started is one of their test applications. And then you can do things like Docker image list to see which images you have on there. And if you want to tidy everything up, you can do Docker image prune and that will get rid of all the unused uh, container, uh, unused images on your machine just to get rid of some, uh, get some space back. A um, couple of other things as well, we can do docker run dash IT. So this makes it interactive over the TTY console. That's what that stands for. So interactive terminal. Uh, you can do docker image RM to remove a specific image. You can do docker container LS dash all. Uh, if you do docker container LS, it will only show you those that are running. Whereas if you do dash all, it will show you the ones that are not in use as well. And then Docker volume LS will list all the volumes. Docker attach is a way to attach your console to a running container. And you can also just stop the container running when you're within it by doing exit. Uh, and that's uh, just a way of stopping the container running. To disconnect, you can just do the control P or control Q and that'll keep it running in the background. And then we've got Docker PS. That basically just shows you which um, containers are running. If I just switch over to here, for example, I do Docker PS. It's not the prettiest of outputs, but I can see on there, I've got dot, dot, uh, dash dot running. I have the registry running. I have Kedrobots, which is the uh, uh, website. And also we have Portainer running on there as well. That's running on 9443. So that's running on 2323. So we can have a quick look at that actually. We go to 9443 and it does require HTTPS and I think I'm an admin on here. I always forget my password for this. Ugh, what did I put for my password on this? I can never remember that. Um, we'll ignore that one for now. <laughs> okay, let's get back to, um, to here. And yes, so if you like what I do, you want me to make more of these types of videos, please give me a like give this video a like, drop me a comment, let me know if there's any apps you'd like to run on your home lab. And um, also, if you've not subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing. It really means a lot to me. I do go live every single Sunday at seven o'clock GMT or British Summertime, whichever we're in at the time. Um, so hop over and uh, join me if you can on there. So let's set up a home server and home lab, shall we? So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna do this kind of live now. Um, so that's a, it's a different machine, let's ignore that one. And let's go over to our desktop. I'm gonna try and do this um, live. So I've got a brand new Raspberry Pi 5 here. This is a, an unboxed one. I bought this one yesterday from the, the Leeds Raspberry Pi store. So if you've not seen one of these before, it's quite basic inside. There's our Raspberry Pi, we've got some uh, information there about how to set it up. Now I have already installed onto this flash, um, onto this micro SD card, uh, the Raspberry Pi OS, because it does take a little while to do that. So I'm just gonna push that into 
the uh, slot just there. And what we need now is some power and also I've got to plug in this video so we can actually see what's going on as well. So if I plug this in here, plug in the power and then if I quickly switch over to this one here, this will, once it uh, has done uh, a quick post check, this will change from these, uh, these little bars to, let's see if we can get, there we go, Raspberry Pi desktop. So the first time it loads up, um, I think he has to expand the file system. So I'm not sure if he just did that a couple of seconds ago. Um, I also just need to plug in a keyboard. I'm just going to do that now as well. Let's plug in a keyboard. And I'm going to let it use the, the Wi-Fi connection as well. So these colored bars just mean there's no video coming from the Pi just while it, uh, it boots up. Right, I'm just going to give that a second. I wonder if we can get me in the corner, actually. Let's see if I can uh, add in an extra camera on here. So let me just pick, uh, let's see. Oh, I don't want the screen share. That's the wrong button. I wanted the camera. Let's see, there we go. I'll just put me in the corner over that. Okay, so this is our Raspberry Pi desktop. I've just got a regular keyboard and mouse plugged into the Raspberry Pi. And this is the first instance of this Raspberry Pi running. So it's not got any updates or anything installed on it. I don't even know what IP address it is. So let's have a look over here. Just hover over this. And I can see this connected to my home network, which is good. If I just hover, it should tell me 112 is the... Uh, the address there right so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to grab those clustered pi files so if I do git clone https colon slash slash github.com slash Kevin McAleer oops and then clustered pi like so so that should grab, if I've typed that right, yes, the clustered Pi code should download it onto this Raspberry Pi. And then we can start put, bringing some of those um, Docker instances, those Docker images up on our brand new home server that we, we are creating now as we speak, our home lab and home server. So it just takes a couple of seconds. It's quite a big, um, oops, keep knocking my phone. It's quite a big repository, this. That's why it takes a couple of seconds. So if I now do change directory, go into clustered Pi. Uh, and let's go into stacks and let's have a look what we've got in here so we've got a whole bunch of different things that we can install now before I install these we need to install docker so let's go into um, I'm going to go into the playbooks so before I discovered docker I used Ansible quite a bit for installing things and one of the things on here is docker so I'm going to actually use this docker install uh, script let's just let's just have a look inside it first so if I do docker dash install trying to do auto complete here docker in nope not docker prune docker install if I type it correctly then it should auto complete docker install dot sh so this is what this script is going to do. It's basically just going to make sure those packages are installed. It's going to do a sudo apt update. Um, it's going to remove this uh, Python config parser for some reason. And if we haven't got the get docker, it's going to grab that. Uh, it's then going to add the user like we looked at before, that user mod. Uh, and it says pi. So I need to change that. That's the first thing I was going to look at. Let's just change that and the other the other instance of the word pi. I keep pressing the wrong key there. Uh, let's just change that to Kev because I've logged in here as Kev. Let's change that there. I think we need to also just change that one to Kev as well. I'll show you why that is in a second if you're not following along. Let's make sure there's no other instances of that. No, that looks good. And then that's fine. That's fine. And that is fine. Right. Let's just... Control X, Y to save. Okay, so let's now run that file. So I think to run it, I basically just need to do that chmod plus X to make it uh, executable. And let's just type in docker install.h. So if I now do ls, you'll see it's got green and that means that, that file's now executable. So we can now just do dot forward slash docker install okay and has that 
what let's do ls let's see so we should have a get docker if that's run properly it seemed to be very quick when that ran i expected that to take a little bit longer so let me just make sure that did actually work docker install Interesting, it's changed it back to the previous. Um, let me just try that again. Not sure why that didn't work. Docker install. So, this is a live uh, install, so some things can go wrong sometimes. That's really weird. Okay, we'll have to do this the kind of long hand way then. So, let's just open up another terminal. Let's just get this uh, file in one window and then run it in another window so we can basically just copy and paste the bits that we need. I'm not sure why that didn't work. I think it might be detecting that it already exists maybe. Uh, okay. So, oops, let's just scroll that back down. Okay. I just want to get to the top of the... Uh, somebody's saying, should it run a sudo? Let's, let's try that, Wayne. That might be a good idea. Let's try sudo install docker. Well, let's try just sh. No such file. Why on earth can it not find that? Okay, I'm going to do it the way that I expect then. So let's just do cat install docker one more time. I, I created this to try and make things easier, and obviously this has just backfired there. So docker.sh. What is going on there? So let's just change that again. Plus x docker install.sh. That's cat docker install.sh. There we go. So I'm basically going to open up another terminal here next to it and basically just run the, the lines one bit at a time. That's probably the easier way to do it. I'll, I'll find out why that's not working and, and update the script so that that works. Because you should be able to just run it straight off. So the first thing we're going to do is a sudo apt update, sudo apt update. That's usually quite quick because it's just grabbing the manifest of the updates. Um, you do usually do a, an up, upgrade after that, but we're not going to do that. No, we're now going to do a sudo apt install. And we need to have the following packages. Let's find them. So lib uh, ffi dash dev. We need lib ssl dash dev. We need Python 3, that's quite a big install. And we also need Python, let's just move that out of the way there, Python 3 pip. Python 3 pip. Okay, let's get it to install that. Yes, please. And it's going to grab those and it's going to install them. So this is where the Raspberry Pi 5 is quite good because it's quite quick at doing that. See, it's done it. Okay, what we need to do then next is we need to... We can skip that about the Python config part, so that's not a problem. We need this curl command here, so let's just grab that. So this curl command is basically going to grab uh, the contents of this. Uh, let me just copy that there. I've got a bit of a like a drunken cursor going on here. There's a slight lag because we're watching this over a capture card, and. Um, that seems to make it look like a, a drunken cursor, so it's, it's difficult to uh, control through here. If I, was, if I was directly plugged into a monitor, I think it'd be fine, but because I've got it through the capture card, it's a bit tricky. There we go. It's kind of messed up a little bit in front of that. Let's just get rid of that 200. And then run that, and that's that'll be a really quick to, command to, to to run so why can't it x why can't it do that let's just move that i'm slightly blocking the end of the command line there ah it's got a little funny character at the end there let's get rid of that so failure 
writing to output destination. Maybe that's why there's an issue. So let's see where we are. All right, so we're, in a, we're in a directory where we can't normally run things. Well, let's go into documents for a second. Documents, there we go. Ugh. And let's just run that command again. There we go, curl. Ah, and it's because <laughs> this is another instance where I changed it on the script and then it's it's reset it back. So that curl command is doing home slash pi and needs to be home slash kev. That's the problem there. I always think it's important to show you me making mistakes because um, it just keeps it real. Okay, there we go. So if I now do ls, we'll see that we've now got in the um, directory beneath this one. So if I go back one directory, there we go, get docker. So we can now change that like we did before, change mod plus x and then the get docker. Okay, and that will make it executable. It should be now green and we can now do get docker like so. And that will now go and grab docker run the get docker install script from docker themselves it just takes a couple of moments for it to do that and then there's only a couple of other steps that we need to do after that which is mostly um just fixing some permissions so that it can run <laughs> vince says wishing i could help poor kev <laughs> I'd, I'd created this script i'd not actually tested it out i wanted to show you op opening a raspberry pi 5 and if i unbox that it kind of ruined that little surprise there as well wouldn't it so uh, that's why I didn't uh, run that. <laughs> that's my excuse. So it doesn't take too long to install Docker. Uh, and then we can start up, upping some, bringing some of these applications up that we have in those stacks. So while that's installing over there, let's just grab the next command that we need to run. So it's just this user mod one. So I'm just going to grab that. So sudo user mod ag docker care. Might be able to type it faster than I can cut and paste from here. Copy. There we go. Okay, that's now installed. So we can now just paste that command we just uh, grabbed. Paste that there. Okay, and then we need to do the sudo unmask. I'll just grab my keyboard. That worked quicker than I thought it would do. So sudo and then system, sorry, user mod. We've got user mod, so it's system control CTL unmask Docker. I always imagine it's like a Scooby Doo moment and um, unmasking Mr. Johnson, the fairground keeper. Right, so we're now going to do sudo and then change the mode. So this is going to mean that um, other applications can then check. They can read and write. So 666 is to do with the Unix file permissions. Uh, I was thinking about this this morning in the shower, figuring out what the sixes are. I think that's a read and write, but not execute. So read, run, and then docker.sock. And a sock is like a, a socket for Docker. Um, so it's like an inter-process communication. So let's just now scroll that down a bit more to the bottom. And I think the, yeah, the next one is install docker compose. Now I have had some problems on a Raspberry Pi installing this. So if we do uh, Python three, let's see if it will let me do this. It probably won't let me do this because of the new way that uh, Raspberry Pis have Python environments um, sort of sequestered off. So if I do pip install and then docker dash compose, because docker compose is actually a Python script, which is quite cool. Okay, yeah, so see there it's uh, not allowing me to do pip. Let's try pip3. I think is it dash n? Let's just try pip3 on its own. And once we've got that, we can then finish the job. If, if this one doesn't work, we can do sudo apt install. So, yeah, I got this message before. Basically, it's, it's not happy with some component in there. So let's just do sudo apt install docker compose instead. And that seems to do the trick. So yes to install all that. I think it has to do like a full Python install. But again, it's quite quick on the Raspberry Pi 5 to do this because um, it's uh, so much faster. So 50% through, 60% percent 
and then it's just going to do the install of that which is pretty quick as well I think okay so while that's doing that let's just go over here and go back and have a look at some of these stacks that we've got on here so these stacks are ones I pre-configured that I've been running for quite some time now so we've dash is the one that we looked at uh, a, a couple of moments ago eclipse mosquito is a cool one that's for creating uh, an mqtt broker we've got home assistant there we've got um, the whole kev's robot stack we have mastodon mongodb mysql nginx node red portana post what's that postgresql and we've also got it's got a mouse in the way there um, the weather code, I think that's for um, the weather kit that I've got there. Uh, random facts, which is a new Python service I created the other day. Um, so we can have a look at that random facts one, actually. Let's go into that one. Let's have a look what's in there. Oh, so <laughs> there's nothing in there. I wasn't have updated that one yet. Okay, let's go to um, what will be a cool one to run. Let's try Home Assistant. Let's see if this one works the way I expect it to. Okay, let me just go and check back on the other window there. Yep, that's all done. So that should mean now we can do the Docker Compose. I think the last command for this was that we basically just started the Docker service. So if we do sudo systemctl start docker, I think that's it. Yep. You can also enable that service, and that means that if the service stops, it will restart it. So I think if you do enable that will make sure it survives a reboot so there we go and if we need to if we now do docker ps uh, it's saying that we need permission now we've added all the permissions in there so I think that might basically just need to have a reboot so let's just reboot the pi uh, in its six we'll do that it'll just take a couple of seconds for it to take that down and then bring it back up again these bars are just my capture card saying that there's no HDMI video coming through so once this has come through we can then um, bring up um, an instance of something like home assistant I'll not set it up I'll just show you that it this is this is how easy it is to do it and you'll see it's uh, downloading some of the packages and things like that as well right so let's go into a terminal let's do docker ps perfect so the fact it says that container ID there's nothing running there but it does mean that uh, docker is accessible now as a regular user so if you go back into that uh, clustered pi folder so the clustered pi stacks and then we're going to go into the home assistant one and then let's have a look what we've got in here so there's just one docker compose file let's have a quick look at that and it's just got a couple of things in there so there is the home assistant service it's going to create a container called home assistant it's going to grab it from the uh, that particular ghcr.io repository uh, it's going to create two volumes one which is mapped to home pi clustered pi home assistant config so we'll just need to edit that to be kev instead of pi uh, it's going to it's going to continue to restart it unless it's stopped it's running in that privilege mode and it's also going to try and run it on ip address 150. Um, now that might clash with an existing one so let's see what happens on there but um, i'm basically just going to edit the file uh, using nano just to change that one line so instead of it being home pi it's home kev because that's the username of the user that uh, has everything installed there so if i now do docker compose and then up up dash d let's see what happens so it's not happy about that um um network so it says there basically just do docker network create so we can do that create and my mac vlan active is a bit of a um, a deeper dive thing we'd have to cover off in a different show i think but it's a type of network that docker uses uh, and it means you can have like other ip addresses um, that you specify uh, which is what that 150 thing is all about right if i do that and i try again I like the way it helps you out with this so there you go so what it's doing now is it pulling all the different parts of the docker container because docker containers contain almost like different pieces of the jigsaw different um, subsections that make up the container so one of them might be like python 3 so if a new version of python 3 comes along um, you could update your container to have that latest version so it kind of splits these things out so 
it's downloading these now. Once it's downloaded all these different things, it will then bring up Home Assistant really quickly. So it's just down, it's just down to how fast your broadband connection is. So I'm streaming and downloading at the same time. So streaming up, but download, downloading at the same time. So my bandwidth must be like maxed out at the moment. Once it's pulled these, I think it then has to extract them because they're kind of like a zip file. They're, they're encrypted and compressed um, for security. So once it has downloaded them, it will just expand them extract them out they go extracting so you'll see all these little things sort of say extracting duh, 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 duh. and once the pull's complete that means the image is ready ready to be used so once the last one's done it can then start running it and running it with the configuration that we have in this home assistant.config file that i previously built um, so let's see how far that gets if it works it works if it doesn't we'll move on and i'll show you some other things about how how i've set up the uh, the dns and the routing and so on for to make this home um, server work with home.kevsmac.com because uh, I think that's quite a cool thing to look at. So I think this 400 meg file is quite a chunky one there so that might take a little while to do. I think I need to get some DW on <laughs> DW40 on my chair. I've got a squeaky chair going on there. So while that's going to downloading, I'm going to flick over to the slides and just carry on just because this is going to take a little, a little while. So Arav is asking, is this a four or eight gig model? So a very easy way to answer that on uh, Raspberry Pis, if you want to check yourself, if I just go over to here and run a, another terminal, if we type pin out, and then let me just move this across here, and then if I just scroll up on here, you get like a little image of the Raspberry Pi. So it's a Raspberry Pi 5B, and you can see there that it's... Um, does it tell us the, the memory that's in it? If I scroll down, I think on here somewhere it tells you the actual spec of the machine. There we go. So this is an 8 gig version. There you go. And it's running on the micro SD. So if I run this on one that's got the NVMe hat, you'd see that it say NVMe instead of micro SD. I will upgrade all these to have NVMe's shortly. Um, it's just hard to get all of the hats at the moment. So that's a, a quick way to find out if you have for eight gig version. I went for the, the eight gigs on all of these. <laughs> hey Darcy, how's it going? There's no Java on this show, I'm afraid. So yeah, I've got two of these um, Raspberry Pi. Where's the case gone for that one? And yeah, both of these are the eight gig version. So I think it just says on the, the top there, or on the bottom there, eight gig. Cool. Right, so has this nearly downloaded? We're about 80% done now, aren't we? I'll let this carry on and then we'll just complete the install. Now I think um, Maria uh, Shah is doing a, a Docker show very soon or has she already done it? I can't remember. So I'm going to be a guest on her show. I think it's next Monday night. No, so, so not tomorrow, but a week tomorrow. So we'll be talking about robotics with uh, Maria. And she has a channel that's called Python Simplified, which is really cool. So if you've not checked that out, you absolutely have to check that out. I'm pretty sure you've uh, already seen Maria's stuff already. But she's, she's, I think she's studying computer science and she's kind of teaching what she learns at the same time. So it's a really good reinforcement of what she's learned. Uh, but yeah, she's a very good tutor. Okay, so we've very nearly installed, uh, well, downloaded this. Oh, so it's extracting now. That means it has downloaded, which is cool. And there we go, so the download's complete. Here we go. Yeah, she's good, isn't she, Darcy? <laughs> Love it. Okay, so now it's doing this, it's probably just doing a little bit of housekeeping in the background with all those images, and then it's gonna bring up Home Assistant. There we go, so it's just extracting that other one out there. And then I think it's got those other three to go. It's very exciting. Once you've downloaded these images, it does cache them in the background, so you don't have to download them again unless there's an update to them. So I think you do like Docker pull to get the latest version of it, uh, otherwise it'll just stay there. Right, so it's now creating our Home Assistant. You can see there, that little command. And then once it's done that, it will tell us that the uh, the application is up. So there was an issue there, and it, it was the IP address. I said that might happen because the IP address was... Uh, uh, 150 so what we can do we can actually change the IP address so if we just go back on there we don't have to download all them again we can simply just come down here let's just change the IP address to be 151 150 151 let's go for that okay let's save that out and then let's just do docker up so it doesn't have to do all the downloading again uh, it's still not happy about that so it says the IP address is supported when connected to networks uh, the other, hmm, 
So I'd have to troubleshoot that one. We know it would work. That's probably a specifically weird one. The reason I had a, sp um, um, a specific IP address is because I wanted to, uh, to use that so that I knew exactly what that would be um, when I connected to it. So if I just um, hash these out, if I just comment these out, we can probably get it to run uh, without that information. It doesn't really need it to be there. We can do the same with those three lines there as well. Let's give that a go. And then let's just try and bring it up again. It's going to recreate it. And it's done right, so it's, it's now up. So if we do Docker PS, that's now running. Oop, Docker PS even. That's now running in the background. There we go. And we've not export, exposed any ports, so it's running, but it's running inside that container and we, we can't actually get to it. So we would actually have to expose ports 8123, eight, I think it is. Uh, have we actually exposed that in the Docker Compose file? So run the same command twice. It's already up, so that's fine. Let's just have a quick look inside there. So we can basically just add in here port or ports and then just add in these lines so we want port 8123 to be mapped to port 8123 i think that's it let's just save that out yep that's fine and then we can do even though it's still running we can say dock up and it will recreate it and then it will only swap it out when it's finished building that uh, that new container so it's building a new container, swapping it out. So if I now do Docker PS again, we hopefully can see that that port is now exposed. And that means that we can connect to it and um, we can see what Home Assistant looks like. So yes, so port 8123, which I think is the Home Assistant one. So if we load up a browser in here, so this is within the Raspberry Pi, but I could, I could launch this from the Mac as well if I wanted to. Did I hit the right button? Yes, I did. Right, and if we just go to the local host on here, so I think it's 192.168.1. And what was the IP address we're on the machine here? 112, 112, and then port 8123. Home Assistant, there we go. So we brought up Home Assistant. It's ready to create my new smart home. So if I click on that, it will then start doing all the user setup so that's how easy it is <laughs> to to bring up an application you can basically do that with any of the stacks that are on there so if you find an application you can find a docker version of the application pretty simply so i'm going to go back now over to the keynotes and we can just have a quick look at some other bits and pieces so how all this works and this this home server and mapping um, a domain name so that you can basically type in something like home.kevsmac.com uh, there's a few things that are going on there, some quite techy things in the background, but I'll, I'll talk you through how this is happening. So uh, we have these Raspberry Pis, they're connected to my local router, and my router is connected to the internet. And there are some things in the background, we'll cover these off in a second, um, that allow traffic to go from home.kevsmac.com to find that being hosted on these Raspberry Pi in the container, in the Docker container, and then push all that information back uh, to that web address so that we can see it live. So my home router redirects all traffic that comes to uh, home.kevsmac.com to my home network. And then Homer can have that link, that little tile. So when you push that, you can then get through to say Home Assistant. So at high level, that's kind of the, the different, the, the, the route that's going on there. So to make this work, we need a domain name. I bought kevsmac.com years ago when domain names were cheap and people didn't tend to buy them. But it's actually quite hard to get a, a short domain name nowadays. All the good ones have been taken, particularly if it's .com. If you have something like .xyz or, or an, any infinite number of other extensions, I think they're a bit easier. But the .coms are quite uh, quite used up. But you can buy them from sites like godaddy.com. That's the, the site I use to, to buy all my domain names. I'm one of those people that hoards domain names and has way too many. I think I bought one. Uh, yeah, that, what was it? Yeah, that's what it does.com, something like that. I don't know. Okay, so I own this uh, kevsmac.com and I'm going to use that for my home server. So that home dot 
kesmag.com, that prefix is a subdomain and we can create as many subdomains as we like. And I use Cloudflare to protect my home network so I don't actually expose my pure home IP address. Um, Cloudflare disguises that uh, and puts a different IP address kind of in the way of the user. So if somebody tries to attack my home network, they're basically just attacking Cloudflare and they can protect, they can prevent um, denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks. Uh, so, and it's also free to use as well, Cloudflare. So that's quite cool. GoDaddy does charge, I think, an annual fee or every three years to renew your domain name, but it's quite cheap to do that. So routing is something we need to, to be comfortable with if we want to route traffic from home.kevsmac.com through to our Raspberry Pi. Uh, now your home broadband comes with a router and typically that router does like Wi-Fi as well, but hopefully it also has a wired socket. Now if you're gonna be doing any kind of hosting, you'll probably want to have a wired connection uh, to your, your devices. So my Raspberry Pis, so these ones behind me here, they have a little router underneath them, a little uh, switch. And if you want something a bit more heavy duty, so my home lab is going to be upgraded to this uh, Aruba switch here. It's just got like, how many is that? 24 ports. Um, it's a little bit noisy, so I need to sort of find somewhere for that to live where it doesn't disturb my live streams. But that'll give me a lot more ports than I currently have available. So that's going to sit between my, my home router and the Raspberry Pis themselves, that switch down there. And my router is connected directly to my broadband connection, which is to my internet provider, which is British Telecom. And then British Telecom, and then enable all traffic um, from the internet to sort of travel it between um, my Raspberry Pis and the, and the world. Now, obviously, you don't normally host things in your home network, so you have to do a bit of hacking of your router to make this happen. Uh, but most routers have this kind of capability in there. They call this port forwarding, uh, and sometimes they call it an IDMZ. It's like an, in, um, or, or DMZ, industrial demilitarized zone. And it's a way of protecting the internet traffic and all bad actors from attacking your home network. So they only allow traffic in that you allow in. So the way that you do this is with port forwarding. So you can see here on my home router, this is my BT business smart hub. Um, I've got a couple of different rules and the two rules that are important here is these ports, the external ports 80 and the internal ports being mapped to port 80 and they're being mapped to the IP address 192.168.1.4. So one of my Raspberry Pis behind me, the fourth node, uh, is also running an Nginx load balancer and this means that it can take all the traffic that comes from the internet to those port 80 addresses and then it can then redistribute it to the correct place. So my home weather server is only running on one particular Raspberry Pi node, not 1.4, so I think 1.3, and it's also running on port 3000, and I think it's port 3000, uh, the Grafana instance. So that Nginx can actually map those uh, IP addresses, it can look at traffic that's coming in and direct it the right way. I'll show you how to do that in a second. But essentially what you need to do in your your uh, home router is set up some port forwarding uh, so that you can connect port 80 and port 443, which is like secure uh, HTTP to the outside world. It does mean that that machine is then not really protected by your home router, so the, the firewall is off in effect. Uh, and you can see here, here are some of the, um, this is on Cloudflare, this little screenshot. Uh, and I've created a, a, uh, a name record, which is like the, the host name, uh, food. So the sub subnet um, food.kevsmac.com, the food name there uh, has an IP address of that router that's behind me. So those uh, you need one for each subdomain that you want to create. And then these other numbers over here, these are 185199 uh, I think they're all GitHub. So if you go to kevsmac.com, you get like a really basic looking page with some links because it's like a really old web page, but they're actually hosted on GitHub's repository. And then there's some other things on there as well, such as like the World, World Wide Web C name is like an alias, and that basically just takes you to um, that first one there, I think. These proxy things mean that uh, Cloudflare, they actually cache some of the content, so it makes it much quicker. So when you're, you're accessing kevsrobots.com and there's like a great big uh, image file, it probably has a local copy of that and serves you that copy rather than hitting my server for every single one of them because that would be really, really slow. 
So Nginx, I was talking about that. So I have an Nginx server running. Uh, you can actually look at the content of that if you really want to on um, looking if you download that clustered Pi uh, repository that we did earlier in the show. Uh, you can basically look at the Nginx stack and that has all the configuration in there. So I've got this little snippet here where it says, listen on port 80 to foo.kevsmac.com uh, foo and then proxy pass. So basically just forward all that information on to 192.168.1.100.9925 and that's what that melee is running on on that other. So 100 is another Raspberry Pi 5. Uh, I think that's dev dev one or dev two, uh, and if you if it hasn't got um, uh, an index at HTML or anything like that, this is what these try files do. So it looks for uri.html, the uri itself, index at HTML or just index to HTML. So it tries all these different things. Otherwise, it'll just give you a port four hundred four not found. So these things make our services a lot easier to access. It's a bit of hacking once, and then uh, it's it works forever. So if you like these kinds of things, you want to learn more, and I will be putting up a Docker um, course. I've path built it. I just need to build out some more to make it look a bit prettier. Uh, that'll be available on kevsrobots.com slash learn forward slash, and you can uh, learn all about Python and robotics and so on uh, for free. So check that out if you've not checked that out already. And we do have merch. You can get these hats. We will be selling the uh, the things. I promise we'll be selling these very soon. We just need to work out with our shipper the uh, shipping rates. And we also need to get a government EOR and I number, I think it is. Some kind of economic registration number. But yes, the Robot Makers Almanac will be available very, very shortly. And you'll be able to get yourself one of these. I'll be selling those at the uh, Makers Central as well this year, I think, too. So head over to kevsrobots.com slash merch to check out the merch store. Help support the show. And if you've not joined our Discord server, then go over to kevsrobots.com slash Discord and you can join the party there as well. I know Darcy was talking about uh, setting up a Discord server of her own. It's very easy to do, Darcy. You just need somebody to give you a hand setting up all the different channels. And if you want to join me on social media, I'm all over social media and you get all kinds of behind the scenes things. I did a fun little video on social media about this uh, robotic egg cup, which has got this little server that sort of cracks the egg. Um, it's based on Robbie the Robot. A lot of people thought this looked like Vincent from uh, Black Hole, but it's actually all Dr. Robotics, is it, from uh, Robotnik's from Sonic the Hedgehog? But no, it's actually Rob Robbie the Robot. So I'm on uh, threads at Kevin McAleer at threads.net. I'm on TikTok at Kevin McAleer6. Uh, I'm uh, on Instagram at Kevin McAleer, on X at Kev's Mac. Uh, on Mastodon at kevsmac at mastodon.social and I'm also on um, blue sky at kevsmac.bsky.social as well. So if you're on there, follow along and say hi. And if you want to get your name in the end credits, you can do that as well by going to kevsrobots.com slash coffee. Uh, you can buy a physical coffee. If you're watching the show live, you can do a super chat. If you're watching this on replay, you can do a super thanks, which is a little thanks button underneath the uh, the main player. And you can also join the YouTube channel membership program, um, which is just the price of a coffee every month uh, by clicking that little join button, which is also just below the main uh, viewer window as well, if you're watching on desktop. So here is some of the supporters I just want to give a shout out to. So we have a new coffee uh, bought today from Steve Robinson. Thank you for that, Steve. I really appreciate that. Uh, somebody else who wanted to remain nameless uh, bought a coffee and uh, Maria Louise May did as well in the past month. And uh, we have members on the uh, Buy Me A Coffee side. We've got uh, Alvaro Diaz. We've got Maria Lu Louise Mayer. We have Jeff Johnson, Dean Corti, Marlene Brent, Tom Shemi and Steve Phillips. Hi to everybody that's in the, the live chat. We'll have a chat in a second. I've got so much stuff to show you from the Raspberry Pi shop in a second. And then on the YouTube membership side, we've got Vince who uh, joined last week. So, hey Vince, thanks for joining. We've got Alistair Ware, John Paul Jolly, Cassie, Dale from Hybrid Robotics, Tinkering Rocks, JDM, Johnny Bates, Bill Hoy, Oxrad39, Hans from Cheerlights. We've got Michael and of course we have Tom as well. So I think that is everything I've got for you for the main show today. So this is the point of the video where YouTube will suggest some videos, I think, over here uh, of videos that you th think you will find um, interesting, uh, also to do with robotics, Python, Raspberry Pis. So definitely check, check, uh, check one of those out as well. And if you're watching this on replay, this is the point of the video where I'll say thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time.